I grew up reading about politicians and public servants. I grew up reading about leaders. I read about a great leader who stood up and said, democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that was my introduction to democracy. I grew up reading and reciting the speech of the first prime minister of this great nation, who at the stroke of midnight said, as long as there is suffering, and as long as there are tears, our work will not be over. And that was my introduction to public service. I grew up reading about a leader who marched across Selma, rallied an entire nation together, and stood up in Washington and said, I have a dream. And that was my introduction to purpose. And I grew up reading about a leader who was born in this very same state, but today belongs to the world, who stood up, and with him a nation stood up, who marched, and with him an idea marched. A Mahatma who walked us to freedom and beyond. And that was my introduction to leadership. These were my heroes. They inspired me to do what I do today. They made me realize the promise of public service and the duty of nation building. You see, I'm a millennial. I'm a 90s child. I was born around the same time when we opened the economy in this country. I saw an ancient civilization, which was now a modern state, open her arms to the rest of the world. I saw a prime minister speak in Hindi at the United Nations. I saw our flag land on the moon. I saw our army reclaim Kargil. I saw our spacecrafts enter the orbit of Moon and Mars. I saw our citizens stand together during 2611. And I saw our cricket team lift a World Cup. I've seen this nation see big dreams and achieve each one of those. I've seen our citizens woo the world and us set new standards. And still, last year when I came across a survey by the World Economic Forum that said that 86% people in the world today believe that we are undergoing a global leadership crisis, that our politicians are the second least trusted people on the planet, I was not surprised or shocked. Having grown up in small towns and villages of Bihar, where I would see my young friends who would be frustrated when there would be a power cut the moment they sat down to do their homework, or who would be angry and upset when they could not find a single clean playground to go and play when they wanted to relax. I was no second-hand witness to what a global leadership crisis looks like. I may not have seen the world then, but I had a perspective how people all around the world feel when they have been let down by their politics and their politicians. When our governments fail to serve us and our politicians fail to show up, what kind of a leadership crisis we see in remote, disconnected parts of this country and the world is not a story that most of us are strangers to. So when I heard about this survey, I read more and more. And I wondered if it was something that told us or asked us to be more cynical, to give up hope, or it was something that invited us to the larger cause. And I choose the larger cause. And I invite you to choose the larger cause. Because remember, this is the generation that will have to be the defining generation in the timeline of human history. This is the generation that will, on one hand, have to bring more nuclear energy and on the other hand, we'll have to fight for nuclear disarmament. This is the generation that will have to send more and more of its citizens to work and continue to bring more and more robots to our industries. We are the only generation that will have to fight both against rising intolerance and rising sea levels. We'll have to detoxify the air that we breathe in and the conversations that we have. 
We are the first generation. The first generation that will have to move both inwards and outwards as individuals, as citizens, and as nations. So I did not come here today to introduce you to a big crisis called the global leadership crisis. I came here today to invite you to a big global opportunity. And you know what that opportunity is? The next prime minister is in a classroom today. And we can change the way we run this country and we see this world if we can educate that child right. So let's get started. If I told you that you were a teacher, for the next few minutes, imagine being a teacher. A teacher in a classroom, a classroom of some 40 students, each coming from a different background, each known for something or the other, a bad excuse or a good joke, a melodious song or meritorious work. And if I walked in and told you, that the next prime minister is in your classroom, would you react any differently? Would you look around at least one time, trying to hear the words unsaid, the dreams unnoticed, the actions that you never thought existed in that classroom? Would you look for that dream in every eye and the hope in every heart one more time? So I'm not making this up. This is true. The next prime minister of this country is in a classroom already. And can we change the way we educate him or her? And that is what all of us, not just as teachers, but as parents, as friends, as siblings, need to think about. So here's what I propose. For a world that is becoming increasingly complex, we'll have to teach our kids to be next generation leaders. I envision four key skills for every single child in this country and in this world, and two core values that should drive us when we are in our classrooms and even when we are in the prime minister's office. Those four key skills are crit critical thinking, research, communication, and leadership. And the two core values are empathy and fearlessness. So let's get started. Let's get started by bringing the first two into our classrooms, critical thinking and research. For a nation that wonders very often that will we continue engaging in a politics of right versus left, or will we engage in a politics of right versus wrong? Will our children choose politics of fear or politics of hope? Will our, will our children continue to see people as numbers and percentages on the electronic voting machine and in the electoral records of this country? Or will our children see our people as people and as individuals with unique stories and unique backgrounds? In order to decide that, let's bring that first lesson of critical thinking and research into our classrooms. Let's begin putting our kids into situations. Let's take them back to 1991 or to 1965. Let's take them to 1984 or 1947. Put them in a situation, be it the opening of an economy or the closing of a dam, be it an amendment to the Constitution or a group of people protesting to get something done, and ask them to take decision-making positions. So for example, let's get started with the opening of the economy. Ask your kids to be the finance minister for one day. Not like how they do in the movies, but how we should do in our classrooms at homes. Ask your children to write two notes. The first note as a finance minister of India who wants to tell this country why the opening of our economy is good for this country. But that's not it. Ask them to write another note. As the finance minister of India, telling our citizens what all can go wrong and why this may not be a good thing and why this nation needs to be prepared. Ask them to write both of those notes and then write a final note based on their own research, based on their own conclusions, one that gives a balanced finding and an honest idea to every single citizen in this country about a policy that can go right or wrong and our citizens will not have to read newspapers or climb up a radio station to find out what's happening in this country. Let's start doing that through our own classrooms. Let our kids have a balanced perspective and a balanced opinion through their own education. Now don't tell them what to do. Give them Google. Give them access to libraries. 
Tell them what they are expected to do. Show them how to do it, but let them do it on their own. We'll truly build a nation where we'll not have to fight against the politics of fake news and false narratives anymore. We will be able to bring research into our policy making, evidence into the way our decision making happens. And do this not just in your classrooms, but also as parents, as friends, as people who love and care for other people. Do it in groups. Do it among each other. Try and put yourselves in the shoes of different people. And once we have brought these two key skills of critical thinking and research in our classrooms, let's bring back something that was always kept for the royal families in the, part, in the past. The art of public speaking. The art of communication. Let every child in this country communicate effectively. And you know what's the first step to do that? The first step to do that as a teacher is to look and identify the kids in your classroom who have, who have never ever spoken in the teacher's presence for several weeks in a row. Let's get them to start talking first. Let's get them to stand up and tell the other members of the class what they understand in a particular coursework or what they do not understand. Sometimes, when our kids do not even understand the course material, let's ask them to stand up and share with the class how do they feel. That will make sure that tomorrow, a 32-year-old mother who may be undergoing domestic violence, she will not have to sit back before opening up to somebody who needs to know and who needs to care about what is actually happening to her in her own life. Let's teach all of our kids to communicate effectively and not just great ideas, but also their greatest pains and their greatest insecurities and the fear that may, they may feel in the darkness of a room. Let every child talk, and as teachers and as parents. We can do that. Let's bring the second exercise back. Once we have let every child talk, let's do turncoat debates. A beautiful art of debating, where once you start speaking for the motion, and somebody says, turncoat, and you start speaking against the motion. I know we have seen a lot of people in the past several decades who speak for the motion sometimes and against the motion at other times. No. Let them speak for the motion and against the motion at the same time. Let them find balanced perspectives. Let them gaze good ideas. Let them become people who disagree with others without becoming disagreeable. And that exercise of communication will help us shape the perspectives of our kids in a very balanced way, without us telling them what they should believe, without us telling them how they should behave. Let them grow into fine young leaders. Because remember, we are educating a prime minister here. We are not just educating any ordinary child. But for that matter, if we truly believe in educating a prime minister, we will know that every child has the capability of being a prime minister in this country. So that's about communication. And then let's move to leadership, the final skill. And you know, as well as I do, that a nation that thinks critically that researches deeply, that communicates effectively, leadership should not be something that we need to teach our kids. Leadership will not be caught, will not be taught, it will be caught by our kids, because they will see in their own education and outside the kind of decisions that they need to make. But leadership will need to come with two core values. The first value is that of empathy. Let's turn our classrooms in schools and colleges across this country and the world into places where if a child shows up late to class, the kids ask the child, is everything all right? Was the breakfast too late? Were you ca caught in a traffic jam? Let kids start putting themselves in the shoes of others. Let them understand the pain of others. And in our own classrooms and in our own homes, let's invite every single person to start giving out these assignments to their friends and to their kids. That is, interview at least one person every single week. It can be somebody who you meet in the streets. It can be somebody who you bump into at an airport. It can be somebody in a remote village of India and a big metropolitan. It does not matter. But don't tell kids that people are people. They're not just numbers. Let them go and meet people. Let them understand that every stranger has a child or some strangers have a child. Let our kids grow up with balanced opinions and let that idea of empathy come in through their own exploration of stories and ideas. And finally, fearlessness. Let that begin in your classroom. 
at the end of every class or at the end of every week, allow your kids to stand up and give you constructive feedback as to how you are teaching, how the classes are going, so that kids learn to tell you on your face what they do not like. Because a child who would stand up to his or her class teacher and tell her what's not going right will not tomorrow be scared to stand up in front of his or her prime minister and tell him what's not right. Because that's the kind of nation we want to build and that's the kind of nation that thrives on this planet. So let's do that. And with that, all I want to tell you today is this that with young children who think critically, research deeply, communicate effectively, lead positively, and have the core values of empathy and fearlessness, we will truly address the next global leadership crisis that everybody is talking about. We will truly build a nation where everyone would be seen as equal and we can all move forward as one people, no matter where we live, how much we earn, which religion or which family we were born in. Let's come together and build a great nation and let's come together and build the next prime minister into a great human being, a great individual, and let every single nation swear in quality presidents and prime ministers so that my generation, the 90s children, the millennials, can truly live in a world where they can say, all is great, let's work together to make this world even greater. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.